Hey, Cosmo here. This video will be about creating micro plugins like Dream. If you want a quick introduction to how Dream creates his plugins, I've linked a video in the description describing the general process and how he makes them. However, in this video, I'll be walking you through a detailed step-by-step -step guide in creating a Minecraft plugin for Spigot. We'll be replicating the plugin that Dream uses in his video about drops multiplying when you break more and more blocks. The first step in this tutorial will be to download the IDE that we'll be using to make the plugin. Dream uses Eclipse, but I personally use IntelliJ, which is what I'll be covering in this series. I've left a link in the description to a download for IntelliJ. Now we need to install the program. When going through the installer, you don't need to select any other options other than the default ones. You can now launch IntelliJ. We will want to create a new project. Here, we need to select an SDK. IntelliJ lets you download one straight from the IDE. Leave the default setting and click download. Once it's downloaded, select the SDK we downloaded and click next. We aren't creating a project from a template, so skip this window. Next, we'll want to put in our project name. I'm calling this project Multiply Drops because that's what it'll do. Now we've finished creating our project, but we still have to set up the project structure. To do that, we'll need to download Spigot, which is a Java program that lets us run Minecraft servers and create plugins. I've linked this website in the description. For this tutorial, we'll be using 1.16.1. Now go back to your IntelliJ project and click the Project Structure button in the top right. Click on the modules on the sidebar and then dependencies on the top bar. We'll be adding the spigot file we just downloaded as a jar. Next, click on sources in the top bar. Here, we'll be changing the language level to 8. Click OK. Now we've finished setting up the project for creating a plugin. Let's start coding now. First, we need to create a package to contain all the code we write. Package names follow a convention, which look like this. Here's what I'll be naming my package, but you can replace my name with yours. A package consists of a few components, however, the number can vary depending on how complicated your plugin can get. Let's get started on the first one. Create a class in the package called Multiply Drops. If this is your first time programming in Java, a class is like a blueprint for an object. An object is an instance of a class that is running in a program. You could compare a class to a Minecraft recipe. When we craft something, we also get an item, or object, which has some sort of functionality depending on what the blueprint was. The first thing we need to do with this class is extend its functionality using Java plugin, which is a class that Spigot gives us. Extending a class is similar to taking an item and using it in another recipe to add to its functionality or utility. For example, taking a bow and using it in the recipe for a dispenser. We've translated the bow's functionality into the dispenser now. However, in the case of a Java plugin class, the functionality we want to take advantage of is a method called onEnable, which is something that runs when the plugin is first loaded onto the server. A method is a set of instructions that we can define systematically. In the method, we'll be setting an event listener and also a binding to a command, but first we need to write the code for both of those. Create another class called command multiply. Here we'll need to implement command executor, which is an interface given by Spigot. Implementing an interface is similar to extending a class, but is more like following a door recipe. There is a general structure that you have to follow, but you can use a variety of materials to make it. The class created must follow the blueprint, but there's differences between implementations. Therefore, for the class that we implemented, we'll need to define some methods, namely onCommand, which is the code that will be executed when we run the command slash drops. Now let's work on the meat of the project. First, let's define some properties for this class. These properties are values that we can use anywhere in the class's code. The drops enabled property will be used to determine whether we should be multiplying drops. This value can be either true or false, and the multiplier property will be used to determine how much we should be multiplying the drops by. This is just an integer. 
Now that we have some properties, we can work on the onCommand method that will run on the slash drops command. We want two things to happen. The first is that the value of the drops enabled property will flip to the opposite, meaning if it's false, then it will change to true and vice versa. This is what the exclamation mark syntax does. Additionally, we want the multiplier value to reset to zero. This gives us the functionality to reset how many items are dropping. Also, change what we're returning in the method to true as any execution of this command is valid. If we return false, the server would return an error message to us. So, we've defined a command that toggles some properties on and off, but what about the actual logic for multiplying the drops? We can write this logic in an event handler that happens every time a block is broken. Here's the relevant code. Let's go line by line. When this event happens, the first thing we do is check if drops are enabled. If they are enabled, we'll continue on in the method. Otherwise, we leave the event to normally execute. But let's focus back onto when multiplied drops are enabled. The general logic goes like this. First, we cancel the actual block of break event because we want to hijack it and do our own thing. Next, we want to get the block that was broken and also the tool that the player broke it with. Let's check what drops we would get using the tool on the block. Now, because we cancelled the original block break event, we need to simulate our own. Set the block we broke to be air. Then for each drop that would normally be dropped, we calculate the amount that we want to drop. You can see that this number is a bit exponential. This chunk of code may be a bit complicated, but here's what it's handling. Minecraft has an odd interaction where it will not let you drop more than a specific number of blocks at a time. Meaning, we have to drop that specific number of blocks in stacks until we reach the number of blocks we wanted to drop. This is what we're covering in this chunk of code. I won't explain it in detail in this video, but if you'd like an explanation, mention it in the comments. After this, we increase the multiplier by 1. This is so that the next time we break a block, the number of drops will be increased due to the exponential factor we included in the above calculation. As we added an event to this class, we need to implement the listener class alongside the command executor class. Congrats! We finished most of the code now. The last thing we need to do is add the binding to the command to the main class and also registering the event. So, that's two of the three components finished. The last is the configuration file. In the source folder, create a plugin.yml file. In this file, we need to set a few properties and values. Remember that the value we write in main must copy what you call the package. You can also change the author of the plugin to your own name. Well, that's the plugin finished. Now we can get to learning how to build it and use it on a server. Now, we need to turn this code into a .jar file, which is what we'll include in the server when we launch it. First, go to the project structure button we used earlier and click artifacts. Here, click the plus symbol and add a jar built from module dependencies. Leave the default values and click OK twice. Now, go to the build in the top bar and click build artifacts. This will take the code and configuration file creating a .jar file in the out folder. This is essentially our plugin. Now, go to the directory where you've stored your spigot jar. Preferably store it in its own folder as it will generate its own files when we run it. Something that's important to remember is that you'll need Java to run this jar file. I've included a link to the Java download if you need to install it. Run the spigot jar file and after some time some files will be generated. A EULA text file will be generated and you'll need to edit the EULA property to true and save the file. At this point, you can run the jar again and more server files will be generated. Close the window that opens and drag the artifact jar file into the plugins folder. Now run the jar file again. At this point, the server will be running so we can open Minecraft and join the server at the address localhost.
At the moment, you can see that the game is currently dropping blocks normally. Now, if we do slash drops and break some blocks, you can see that the number of drops will increase as we break more and more blocks. At some point, your computer and server will lag so much that it crashes, but that's kind of the point, right? Well, that's about it. I've taken you through the entire process of developing a plugin, and I hope you understand most of the steps. If you'd like some clarification, feel free to message me on Discord or put a comment down below. I'll be doing some more videos on Minecraft plugins in the future, so subscribe if you'd like to be notified of my videos in the future.